Okay, so I'll see you in about 50 seconds and then oh. jobs are good and tickety boo. So just enjoy the ride of this rather curious okay. music. It's all good. Welcome to another episode of the Good Listening To Show. Your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. The storytelling show that features The Clearing, where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to be told. And where all my guests have two things in common. They're all creative individuals and all with an interesting story to tell. There are some lovely storytelling metaphors. A clearing, a tree, a juicy storytelling exercise called 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, some alchemy, some gold, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare and a cake. So it's all to play for. So yes, welcome to the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Oh, yes, indeedy doody. Welcome, welcome, thrice welcome to a broadcasting goddess stroke legend that is Janie Lee Grace, ladies and gentlemen. How you doing? <laughs> I'm very delighted to properly make your acquaintance. We are mm. both, I'm just going to blow a bit of smoke at you, but there's combined smoking that we're both presenters for UK Health Radio, which is where my podcast always also goes. However, having said that, you go, um, you know, you, you have a legacy of being a long, long standing broadcaster where you're known to at least nine million listeners the globe over because of your associations with the Steve Wright program on BBC Radio 2 way back when. I've heard you myself over many years doing many, many factoids. <laughs> and when I was researching you just today, I heard the quirky thing about how you explained that Elvis Presley used to like to watch three football matches simultaneously on <laughs> TV whilst wearing an American football helmet. He was the king. He could do what he liked. So you are the queen of broadcasting. And within um, the UK Health Radio space, you have the Natural Health and Sobriety Show as your main sort of flagship programme. But anyway, you can tell us more, Anon. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you, Janie Lee Grace, to the Good Listening To Show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. How's that for a bit of smoke blown at you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have clapped along, really, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, and touch. So, yes. Um, this is where we're going to really explain the fact that we this is a show within a show within a show, which is quite, you know, appeals to my acting background, uh, a bit Shakespearean, because you do a show within UK Health Radio. So do I. And then this is about a bit of uh, healthy cross fertilisation, please. Oh, well, um, I love being on UK Health Radio. It's just brilliant to be able to, you know, be part of something that shares so many different aspects of health and well-being. So, yeah, I love it. Wonderful. So um, how's morale? What's your story of the day, first of all? Um, story of the day is, uh, how I'm feeling. Do you mean my kind of how I'm feeling right now? Yeah. Let's be absolutely yeah. present. Let's do that. Okay. So how yeah. are you feeling now? Um, I'm feeling pretty good because the sun is finally shining and I really desperately need the light. It's really felt like, um, it's been dark for so long, like at 11, 11 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, yeah, I'm feeling really good. I actually love this weather. I love it when it's crispy, cold and sunny. Um, so I'm feeling relatively optimistic great beginning and are you sat outside at the moment because you've got a one wonderful... not no no it's just like a kind of screen thing you know covers a multitude of sins right so you've got some serious <laughs> plankage within your studio within your <laughs> just a screen <laughs> that's all just a screen it looks good to me it looks like you're outside by a, uh, you know a bar of some <laughs> description uh, so I'm going to uh, batch you along the storytelling metaphors of the Good Listening To show. It's all to play for because we've got a clearing, which is a serious, happy place of your choosing, which we'll find out about in a minute. Then I arrive with a tree in your clearing. Then we shake your tree to see which storytelling apples fall out. And that's where you've been kind enough to prepare your answers to the exercise 54321. Then there's some alchemy, some gold, a random couple of squirrels, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare and a cake. So it's absolutely all to play for. Um, you are a TEDx talker as well. Um, so do you want to tell us about that wonderful TED talk you did, which is where you got going uh, with your whole um, at genesis of the Sober Club? Mm, yeah, sure. Well, I, um, I ditched the booze just over four years ago, um, came out, as it were, about eight months later. And, uh, I, you know, it's important to stress that I never had a rock bottom moment. It's just that I was drinking more than I wanted to, as so many people are, actually. Um, and then I had never actually 
done a TED talk, although it's something I'd thought about many, many times. And then I, I just kind of saw that there was some applications going. I thought, you know, I've got nothing to lose. I'll just, I'll pitch this, this, this in. Um, and, and actually it was just the most amazing experience. It really was. And the interesting thing is that despite being, um, uh, you know, a speaker and a broadcaster for 30 years, I was mad nervous on the day because I'd completely forgotten that there's an audience there as well as the fact that it's going, going to be broadcast to millions potentially. Um, there's an audience in the room and I had completely forgotten about that until about a day before and suddenly I kind of freaked and thought, oh my goodness, I'm not just doing this to the camera, um, you know, which I'm very much used to working in TV and radio. Um, I've actually got to look people in the eye and it brought a whole new level of uh, of panic but anyways yeah the talk was uh, very short it's called sobriety rocks who knew and um yeah hopefully i was able to get across uh, a few facts and figures my own story but also a little bit of humor and yeah that kick-started my um my what i now do my the sober club that i run which is a platform to, to kind of change the conversation around alcohol and uh and to inspire people in towards positive sobriety towards living their best life but uh underpinned by by ditching the booze and you did mention the use of humour there, which uh, speaks to me because I'm a comedy improvisation performer by training and background. And in your TED talk, which I watched today, actually, you do introduce your your sort of, um, I suppose, comic foil or nemesis within your sort of imposter syndrome skate. Mm. You call her the wine witch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's quite a common thing now. A lot of people use that phrase, but it really is like that. You know, for people who are drinking too much, they make that decision that, OK, that's it. I'm not going to drink or I'm not going to have sugar or whatever it is for you, whatever behaviour change you want to make. And then it literally is like you get the little devil on your shoulder you know and that voice in the head that feels so very strong that yes. addictive voice um you know and I really really had that voice I really did you know it was it was almost as if it was completely separate to me um yes. and it's not until you can kind of really notice it that and, and particularly if you can give it a persona um yes. then then you can start to notice it and recognize you okay I am not my thoughts I can make conscious choices uh, I don't have to do what the voice in my head is telling me to do yes so you know regaining your own voice and being in control of your own destiny is really what's at play absolutely here. yeah and so it's all, you're all about you know being the queen of optimum health and well-being underpinned by sobriety so that's become your main sort of raison d'etre in your i suppose reinvigoration of self three or four years in now is what my assumption is yeah ab absolutely i mean i've always been known for my work around health and well-being and i still do all of that work looking at natural skincare and beauty and uh, you know organic food run the platinum awards every year. um and and you know this is just another layer really because it, it became apparent to me that it was it was the missing piece yes um but but also within this work that i do um there is very much a sense of when people ditch the booze they do start to become who they really are um yes. and and it's it's very difficult to describe but it, it is really rather magical. People do somehow step into their, their authentic selves yes. after they've properly sorted this picture. I mean, I suppose it's obvious, really, if you're pouring toxic liquid in your head every day for years on end, um, you aren't going to be at peace with yourself, let's face it. Uh, but, but magic does happen when people go through this process and they sort of step into this new identity and actually start to like themselves. Yeah, that's Absolutely. really what underpins it all. That really made me laugh. Rather than who fancies a drink, who wants to pour some toxic liquid in there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that is what it's like, isn't it? True. If we want to be truthful, I mean, you know, for years I thought, you know, oh hey, you know, a glass of red wine is good for me. I don't think so, actually. Have a grape, you know. Yes, and that it just appeals to my sense of humour. <laughs> my round, I'll get the toxic liquid in. Fantastic, wonderful. So, um, let's talk you through the storytelling metaphors. So, okay. Where is what is a clearing like for you? You know, where is your serious happy place? Where do you go to get clutter free, inspirational and able to think uh, Janie Lee Grace? Well, for me, it has to be by the sea. Um, I don't get to go to the sea very often, sadly, but uh, in, in if I can go there in my mind or preferably in person, it would be St. Ives in Cornwall. Ah, yes. um, that's my that literally I swear I must have lived there in a former life because when I do manage to get there, everything feels like it fits into place so um yeah any of the beaches actually but I'm happy to choose one that you know has trees near it too in case we need them yes yeah, so you are a mermaid of St Ives is what I'm beginning yeah to hear. yeah 
Uh, not a right. siren because you've given up the drink. You're not tempting people <laughs> in to drink more toxic liquid. Yeah. And in fact, one of the most pleasurable train trundles from Bristol. Oh, is God. Yeah. Fires. Oh, that, that, that little branch line is just absolutely gorgeous. I love it. And in fact, one of my recent holidays was a trundle, 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 trundle from Bristol to St. Ives. And oh, how lovely. Right there at the end of the mm. line, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's right. Mm. So I, I echo, I mean, my, my serious happy place is in a different place to St. Ives. But do you want to be that specific? Would you like to make it that seascape? I don't mind. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what that works for me. But I, I don't mind. It can be it can be any seaside. Don't mind. Well, as, as we went down a riff of uh, Mermaid of St. Ives, let's go to let's let's go there. If you, It's your choice. But I'm, I'm just thinking, oh, that was quite nice that we, we've stumbled onto that. Mm. I don't swim, though. Oh, so you're a crap mermaid, <laughs> what you're just so you know. <laughs> I love being by the water, but I don't need to be in it. OK, so if you are a sea mermaid, you're one that's basically just waist up going. I can't yeah, I just sit there, look pretty. <laughs> You, you're rocking That's the closest I'll be to a mermaid. <laughs> that, that works for both of us. We like this. OK, so now I'm going to arrive just within the shoreline with a tree within your clearing. Uh, and so I'm now going to shake your tree to see which storytelling apples fall out. And you've been kind enough before we spoke uh, to have thought about it's where you've had five minutes to have thought about four things that have shaped you, genuinely, mm. Grace, four things that inspire you. Sorry, three things that uh, influence you, uh, two things that never fail to grab your attention. Right. I might have got my numbers wrong, so you'll have to bear with me if I haven't got enough. <laughs> I'll do my best. Well, I'll tell you what. I your... thought it was two. Was it? Is it four on the first one? I'm well, sure I can come up with them. If we if we do the math, it's called five, four, three, two, one. And it's it's I was getting confused myself yeah, there. Of course. It's five minutes to have thought about <laughs> four things that shaped, three that inspire, two that never fail okay. to grab your attention. And that's borrowed from the film Art where it's a bit oh squirrels. Okay. And what never Just fell. remind me as we go along and I'll and I'll do my best. I so, so you want I'll, you want I'll what do, shaped me? Yes. So I'll do the maths. Four things, Janie Lee Grace, that have shaped you. Okay. So um, I think um, one thing that's definitely shaped me is uh, my love of books, my love of reading. Um, from a very very early age, um, I, I can actually remember the moment when I was first able to read. Um, what I mean by that is not reading out loud. <laughs> yeah. I remember sort of running to my sister and my mum and saying, I've just, I've just, I've got a book and I've just heard the words in my head. Um, you know, what, what's that sort of thing? Um, and so I, I was absolutely passionate about books from a very young age. And, and I really do think that shaped me massively that uh, expanded my world. Um, I've never heard the art or the gift of learning to read as being I can literally now hear the voice in my head. That's a very, mm. very personal way of describing that. Yeah. That so, moment of revelation. Yeah. So books are a very, very big part um, of my of my of, of shaping me. Uh, music. Um, Just before is, you go away from the book, do you, do you remember? Sorry to interrupt you. Do you remember the first book then? Is that still there? The book that did that? Um, for no, I don't remember which book did that for me. I remember the first book I read, but whether I was hearing the words at that time was about um, Jojo the giraffe and his special jo day out. <laughs> but I think I was probably a bit younger then and I was probably reading it out loud. So, no, I don't remember the actual book that uh, where so I where I heard the voices. No. So Jojo the giraffe. Jojo's day out was my very first book that I actually read out loud. Yeah. I like the alliteration there. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's good. Um, music uh, very much shaped me. Um, I, I absolutely adored my, um, uh, you know, kind of watching Top of the Pops and listening to um, the radio. I was absolutely mad about pop, pop music from a very young age, um, always kind of organising bands. And um, I, I remember I had one teacher at school who was a, a guitar player. Uh, and singer, you know, singer songwriter, and honestly, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, you know, when um, when he sort of uh, started playing guitar in class. Um, so music was pop music was always hugely important in my life. Um, and if I may, and forgive this rather personal question, would that have been the first sort of teacher crush that might have happened? Because oh God, yeah, you... definitely, yeah, definitely. And do you remember his name just as well? Um, yeah, his name was um, his name was David, and I think it was Swainston. It's quite an unusual name. Yeah, yeah, definitely first teacher crush. Yeah, yeah. David so that Swainston. was so. Yeah, so music was very important. Um, 
the other thing that shaped me was um I don't know what I don't know what age what age are we allowed to go up to here? Does it matter? Well, the idea behind the sort of genesis of this exercise is round about once a decade, something pretty. I'm not aging either of us here, but, mm. but generally speaking, when we look back with hindsight, mm. round yeah. about once a once a decade, something pretty seismic happens that shapes mm. us, which is why which is what's put behind the design of this. Yeah, it? sure, sure. Um, so I think being part of um, a really great church community when I was um, a teenager, uh, really shaped me. And I, um, I, so I used to go to a church where there was kind of a lot of young people and it was quite, it was fairly cool. But um, what really shaped me was when I went to the Greenbelt Festival for the first time. So Greenbelt is still going, amazingly. And if um, I've sung there as well. And I've sung there, yeah, a few times. Yeah, yeah. And Greenbelt was, uh, was and still is, um, a, a a kind of a cultural festival if you like it used to be much more of a bigger music festival um but now it's it, it's more of a kind of family arts festival it's an arts festival effectively um and when I went there for the first time I suddenly kind of grasped okay you know so church doesn't have to be um you know my kind of initial view which is sort of uh, elderly people in hats um it can be something incredibly vibrant um it it, it can be it, it it can have so many different layers um so yeah green belt was really um massive in shaping who i became who i was and, and in I fact in the years i said i hadn't appreciated that green belt is a is a sort of christian festival yeah okay. yeah christian yeah. arts festival yeah. yeah um and and then over the years as i was touring with bands and um you know sort of in the music biz um i i you know i didn't have a a, a church in inverted commas because i was kind of not really around very much in any one place i was touring a lot so really green belt was became my it was the kind of rock that held me even though it's once a year and a few gigs in between um so it was massively important I don't think I missed a Greenbelt festival in in about 15 years other than um once when I was touring with Wham other than that I didn't miss a festival in fact when my son was born um uh, my first son was born 23 years ago um he was only four days old and we went to Greenbelt I thought I can't miss it so I think he was probably the youngest um baby there so there he was in a metaphorical or literal papoose. He may or may not. Have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he literally was. <laughs> and and were yeah. you had you crossed the line to being on the stage then, or were you still there as a sort oh, of? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I've done. I've been. I've played there in various different guises, in various different bands over the years. But um, yeah, no, my my main my main gig with there was uh, with was with uh, Cola Boy. So so yeah, that was that was before. And I couldn't help, along. couldn't help hearing you you dropped in Wham there yeah, as well, well, which is fantastic. Yeah. Sorry, I, I missed that. You just cut out Sorry, slightly. You you dropped in Wham there as well. I I know as well. So presumably you, you yeah yeah George Michael very well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, to totally. Yeah. So obviously that you know that um, my career as 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 a singer um, you know absolutely shaped who I was. My um, my early days uh, being a backing singer with with lots of bands. Um, yeah, very very much sort of shaped my. Well, I mean it carries on from my love of music, obviously. Um, but yeah, it, it was. I and I think, you know, it's quite interesting as well, just to note that um, I think around in those early in those years, I was absolutely determined um, and, and the odds were kind of against me. You know, there was there was there was I had nothing going for me and uh, that would mean that I would have that kind of career. Um, I was probably destined to work in a, you know, a, a kind of pencil factory. In fact, that's probably the job that would have been lined up for me if I'd kind of stayed put um which that i'm sure is great if that's what you want to do that appeals to my uh, comedy sense of humor about an actor working <laughs> an, an, an actor working in a pencil factory to be <laughs> yeah, exactly to be. yeah um so you know th I, there were no high aspirations within my family um at all yeah so um so it was i definitely had a drive that um i don't know where it came from but it was very very strong very strong in me and i was absolutely determined to um you know there were various there have been various points through my life where I've been absolutely determined and it's just non-negotiable that yeah. it'll happen or something similar so yeah, yeah so kind of getting getting those first gigs as a backing singer yes. it, you know really came out because of that I, I I found ways to make sure I got what I wanted you know
So there's a founding sort of force within your life, which is about tenacity and pulling. Yeah, you absolutely. You to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and you've had many different careers then just in what it is we're describing here. So if someone does ask you that really clunky question that we all experience. So what do you do then? Obviously, I came to you because of, you know, I knew who you were. Uh, and I now know that you're on UK Health Radio as well as sort of natural health and sobriety practitioner. How do you answer now sort of in a nutshell if someone says, hello, what do you do if they don't have any frame of reference? Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I suppose I would say I'm a broadcaster and an author and, um, and, and a, a coach and practitioner. I, I now, you know, coach people and, uh, and offer NLP and a whole bunch of other um, therapeutic stuff around um, well-being and sobriety. And forgive my ignorance, are you still to this day on Radio 2 as well? Yep. as Radio? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so we're still in your tree, uh, shaking the old foliage. Uh, you might have now finished on shapages or there could be one, one else that I've missed there. Uh, no, I think that's it. OK, so now I'll do the maths for, for both of us. Uh, three things that inspire you now. OK, um, is it is it able? Am I able to be? Is it is it? Can it be a person? <laughs> it can be things, attributes, people. Okay. Indiv- you know, it's okay. open to interpretation. All these are metaphors yeah. where there's yeah. no right or wrong. Okay. Um, so what inspires me? Um, well, being by the sea, I think I've probably already made that clear, but I kind of have to say it again because it is so massive for me um, that I, 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 I now take care of myself and make sure that I actually diarise it. For many years, I didn't. Um, but for my mental health and well-being, I need to be by the sea uh, regularly. Um, sadly, I don't live by the sea, um, but it's it just feels so massively important for me to to have that in my life. So being by the sea in nature is um, is absolutely huge for me. Um, I like the fact you diarise the sea as well. That's yeah, amazing. I have to. I have to now, really. Otherwise, yeah. kind of months will go by and then I'll wonder why I'm feeling so out of sorts, um, you know, and then it will come back to me. Oh, for God's sake, you know, just take yourself off on a train and walk by the beach. Why don't you? Um, so that's an important one. Um, what else inspires me? Um, I many, many years ago, uh, one of the reasons that I got into the work that I do now around holistic health and well-being was that I was given a book um, by Leslie Kenton called Endless Energy. Um, and that book literally shaped me. And I read that at around the same time as I read a book, a very old book from the 50s that I found in an ex-boyfriend's mum's house. I just took it off the shelf. It's a really dusty old book from the 50s called Harry Benjamin's Nature Cure. It was all about uh, naturopathy. Um, and reading the two of those books, the book about naturopathy or naturopathy, however you want to say it, and reading the more up-to-date version of by Leslie Kenton just took me on a path that, well, now looking back, I can absolutely see. I mean, my first book was massively inspired by, by Leslie Kenton's book. Um, so, so that was huge inspiration. And where, and then, did your in, where did your instinct come to sort of lean towards the bookshelf and pluck that book that day? Because there is a lovely adage, what's meant for you won't pass you by, which I always really enjoy. Yeah, well, I, was, I, I became very interested in um, optimum health and well-being. Uh, I can't even remember the reason why. I, th- I think I probably was starting to look at, at, at my nutrition. I probably just wanted to get a bit healthier. Everyone was talking about becoming vegetarian or whatever it might have been at yes. the time. So I started kind of looking into some stuff. And as I did so, I realized that as with so many things in this area, you scratch the surface and there's a huge well underneath. Yes. So you absolutely can't just take one thing at face value. So I kind of, uh, uh, you know, I really, I'm a very big questioner. <laughs> I absolutely don't take what people say. I'm a, I am a questioner, no doubt about it. So I wasn't just going to accept that. Okay, well, you know, don't, don't eat this and don't eat that. I really wanted to know a lot more. So, so that's why I kind of dug deep. A questioner and a seeker. A seeker. Yeah, definitely. Very definitely. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to say was I, I kind of, you know, it got me on that path of doing all of that research and wanting to look at uh, uh, the holistic picture. I think even back back then I had a sense that it really didn't work if you just look at the one thing, yes. you know, if you just take the, you know, the the pill for that thing. You really yeah. need to look at the holistic picture. So I also became aware of the importance of mindset 
at the same time as I was looking into the nutrition, I realized that it won't make any, you know, a jot of difference what, how much exercise you do or what good food you put in your body if your head isn't in the right place. Yes. Um, so I started down that path and got inspired by uh, Louise Hay, or, um, Queen of Hay House, who to this day, I mean, I'm a Hay House author now, so that was very cool. Um, but to this day, you know, I still love uh, all of Louise Hay's work. And, um, and, and I started sort of uh, becoming aware of the importance of mindset and meditation and visualization very importantly. Now, it took me years before I actually properly put that in place, but I became, I was very inspired by it. And, and it's a beautiful sort of summation of holistic uh, as a lifestyle and intent, because it's about everything. It's the big picture. It's everything. Almost yeah. the universal approach, not just, a, as you say, the one pill that fixes all, which it can't yeah. be. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's always been my thing, really. Um, over the years, you know, certainly when I wrote my first book, uh, which was called Imperfectly Natural Woman, that was 16 years ago uh, when my daughter was born. And I was kind of ahead of my time. Um, you know, I often joke that I was writing about kale and coconut oil before they had their own publicists, you know, because <laughs> of the research I'd done with yes. Leslie Kenton. You know, I was I was ahead of my time on all of this stuff. Um, but, you know, it does sound like it could be a Carol King song. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so with with all of that, you know, my all the work that came after that, my website and all the stuff I do, which is still going, by the way, yeah. uh, the whole imperfectlynatural.com uh, is all still all still going. But my thing has always been that I have to look at the everything. I can't just niche down to one thing. And so many people have said to me, "Oh, you could do so well if you had your own natural skincare brand, or why don't you have your own brand?" I can't do that. I cannot possibly encourage you and inspire you to use one brand of skincare if you're not also cleaning your clothes with, you know, without chemicals and looking yeah. after your home and spraying the air freshener. You have to look at the holistic picture, which is where the sobriety piece fits in. But of course, for me, not till much later, which is the irony of it all, really, because I was stepping around this goddamn elephant in the room. Right. <laughs> and if I may, with sobriety being the big cut and thrust now, does that mean you are utterly uh, sort of, you know, uh, booze agnostic? No, sorry, you'd leave it alone completely is what I'm saying. Oh, You're God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think my whole um, kind of uh, point that I, I try to get across is that life is 100 percent better without the booze. It's just yeah. when you're drinking, you can't see that when you're drinking, yes. even if you don't drink too much, you probably think, oh, my God, life wouldn't be so good without booze. Actually, the reverse is true. Lovely philosophy. I say we're, we're in the uh, inspirational space. You've been giving me this by the bucket. List. That could be three, actually. I think it is three, isn't it? But I'm, I, I'm not very good at keeping track. <laughs> That's my job. And even I get confused sometimes. OK, now we're going to talk about two, uh, quir sorry, two things that never fail to grab your attention. This is the oh squirrels, you know, whatever else is going on in your life. What always grabs Janie Lee Grace's attention? OK, so. Oh, at that's kind of a little bit like distractancy. Is that what we're talking about? Sorry, the sound snagged there. Just oh, sorry. Yeah. Again. So this is distractions, right? Things that might distract you a little bit. Yes, it's stuff like, you know, rather sadly in my life, a ping pong table makes me go, oh, squirrels, because I love ping pong. So it's just yeah, whatever, sure. whatever. Always yeah, hooks I you think up. for me, it's anything shiny. Really, um, I, 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 there was this fabulous quote that I used to used to say, which was, "I wanted to change the world, but I got distracted by something shiny." <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I just love anything colourful and sparkly. And it, and you know, I, I, I might be going somewhere and thinking, "Oh, I absolutely have to get to a certain place," and then I'll pass a shop window, and they've got the most amazing glittery stuff in there. And I don't necessarily have to buy it, but I have to just look at it. I, I just really love sparkly, shiny stuff. I'm um, and about... bright colours. I love bright colours. So if I if I meet someone or I go into a space where it's just, I mean, I feel like I'm hyperventilating because it's like, <laughs> oh my god, I can't look at everything quickly enough. Um, I'm so I'm a bit it. of a magpie. Ah magpie and i was also hearing a bit of an alice in wonderland uh, rabbit hole whenever there's a rabbit hole of something shiny down you go oh now you <laughs> you froze briefly then so, yeah, we're, so, so did you that's all right but we're back it's we're the back. quirks of zoom it yeah. is telling me occasionally my it isn't doesn't normally happen so i'll have to be well, I virgin media why i yeah. order tell me um, about it yeah anyway um uh, so I did get the shiny. So what yeah. else never fails to grab your attention? And then the other thing I think is um, I'm sometimes um, blindsided by how, by, by people who are 
just do mind blowing things. So what springs to mind is Eddie Izzard, right? I love Eddie Izzard. I mean, I just absolutely love Eddie Izzard. I used to have dreams about him and everything, like seriously think he's amazing. And when I come across, when I, you know, hear of stuff he does, like 50 odd marathons and a whole bunch of shows in, in a French. different language. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I, it takes me away from kind of everything I'm focusing on. And I just go into a complete, how can that be possible? How can that even be possible? I'm so impressed, but, but I'm also a bit kind of nonplussed as to how it's possible. And right? you must have had him in your BBC. Oh God, studio. yeah. Well, interestingly enough, for years and years and years, he was coming in and, and I didn't get to meet him. I was such a massive fan. And it always worked out that I was off having a baby. <laughs> I've got four kids. <laughs> and I was always off having a baby when he came in. So yeah, I didn't get to meet him. And then finally I did. I was so nervous. If you like, if you meet your hero, it's like, you know, are they going to live up to expectations? So I was so nervous. And of course I got massively embarrassed. You know, they massively embarrassed me, but it was fine. He did live up to expectations. And if I may, you were uh, um, running your own marathons metaphorically at the time, if you're going off to have four children, which is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, not all at once, but yes. <laughs> having children is a bit like running a marathon. <laughs> Or, or yeah. have you heard having kids is like having a blender with the lid off? Right. <laughs> yeah. Very true. So you yeah. have met him. I'm delighted. Yes, I have. Yeah. yeah and so him. does he say hi, Janie, now when you meet him? Uh, I mean, I haven't seen him in years, obviously. Um, but uh, but yeah, I wouldn't exactly, you know, he's not exactly a close friend or anything. But um, but yeah, I'm still I still feel the same sense of awe and wonder yes. at what he does. But I do have a, now have a lovely pick of us together. Um, and his lipstick is definitely cooler than mine. And he's got some shoes to give you some competition. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, sure. yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I've got a lovely image of you both totting around near the near the seascapes of St. Ives now. It'd be nice, wouldn't the it? The two mermaids, <laughs> both she and you, which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, thank you. That's great shiny stuff. Eddie Izzard is shiny too. He was credited as being the sort of equivalent of the fifth Beatle. He was the fifth or sixth Monty Python, as they said, wasn't he? Mm, mm. Yeah, definitely. So it's just so impressive. So yes. impressive. <laughs> Wonderful. And now then we're going to talk about a quirky or unusual fact about you, uh, Janie Lee Grace. We couldn't possibly know until you tell us. Oh, God, there's quite a lot, actually. Um, I think probably the one I'll choose is that um, in my early days as a singer, I, um, I was a real life Barbie doll. And this was in a, this was a touring, a touring theatre show uh, for children. And it was literally for Mattel the doll company and they wanted to put a live band together of but with Barbie as a singer so I was I was a, an actual real life Barbie doll with the most massive wig you've ever seen like this massive blonde wig that practically went down to my knees and this ridiculous dress and then I had a kind of rock star Barbie dress as well kind of little leather mini skirt the, whole, the works and then I had a Ken who was also in the band, my boyfriend. And so we did these gigs to, um, to kids in theatres. And then we had to go to the toy shops and like sign the dolls and stuff. It was mad. And then the funniest bit of it all was that because they were really good at getting PR for this tour, I had to be on various radio shows around the country doing interviews as Barbie. So they said, you must stay in character. So if they ask you what you like, you've got to say, well, you know, I'm 12 and a half inches tall and I like chocolate cheesecake. Wow. Also, my head. <laughs> so that was a fun about, acting gig. <laughs> my head spinning about, you know, you, about how most spin offs are merchandising, but you've actually got the merchandising on the stage. And then right there. <laughs> How do you exactly. do merchandising of merchandising and here's some merchandising? <laughs> yeah, so that was fun. I bet you didn't know that about me, but there's lots more if you don't like that one. <laughs> wow, and also that's the idea of not just a boy or a girl band. You were the first doll band. I love that. <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> wow. And, and do you, I'm not trying to age us both, but how, how, when was that in, in your timeline? Oh, God. Um, I don't know. I can't remember, actually. I think it was, um, I think it was probably in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, I think what, what an eclectic years. mix of stuff you've done. Definitely, you know I have. Yeah, there's quite a lot about me that are fun, fun facts you don't, you, you, you couldn't possibly know. <laughs> I mean, whilst we've got you riffing on that, do you want to give us another, you know, no extra charge or welcome, another quick um, fact you couldn't know about you? Yeah, um, I, um, not quite as funny, but I did uh, a track. Um, with Paul Oakenfold, who's now, of course, um, well, and was at the time, very cool D DJ, uh, a, a version of Donna Summer's um, Love to Love You Baby, 
Wow. That was really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's lots. I haven't really prepped enough amusing ones, but yeah. No, wonderful. <laughs> so we've shaken your tree in the foliage and we did quite well with the maths, despite my own confusion. Oh, there. good. So, so now we're, we're, we're hey, we've, we've shaken your foliage and now we're staying in the clearing, which, as you remember, is uh, just from the waist uh, up. Uh, in the uh, Sea of St Ives, as you are a, a mermaid inspired by shiny things. Now we're going to talk about alchemy and gold. So when you are at purpose and in flow, Janie Lee Grace, what is it you're happiest doing or bringing to the world? I think um, I, I think when I'm really, really in flow, I'm I'm helping other people get inspired to reach their full potential. And for me, that almost always means um, looking at the holistic picture. Um, and, I, and I think that's when when I'm at my happiest, actually, because I love obviously I love communication. So I love being able to communicate my passions and my ideas and the stuff that I really feel is important. And when I can see people when I can see that people can become inspired and the light bulb goes on that um that's that's when i feel like okay i'm i'm uh, living my purpose here and and that sort of flow that happens if you're doing a sort of typical life in the day of you or, or a sort of week in your life what are you most happy as, what do you tend to get up to in terms of an archetypal this is living my dream week um well i, I mean i do a lot of stuff within the sober club community that i run which is an online community um i i I do one-to-one -one coaching. Um, I do, uh, you know, sort of group sessions, which is amazing. I might just be answering various posts that someone is 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 wobbling, feeling really wobbly, and sometimes just one little message can change everything for them. Um, but I also uh, run retreats, which I absolutely love doing. I've just trained as a family constellations practitioner, and um, that's amazing work. Really amazing work. It's so, only psychotherapy through constellation. Coaching. Yeah, it's not it's not psychotherapy but the the basis of the work comes from a, a German psychotherapist called Bert Hellinger um, but it is unbelievably powerful work just so incredible so I've got another one of those workshops coming up soon um, and that that is really magical to see the transformation in people in half an hour yeah so yeah that's definitely when I'm in flow well, and so it sounds like you do. You and, and is is it a regular slot that you're always there on the big show with Steve Wright as well? Is that like a regular thing? Yeah, a couple of times a week. Yeah. So that I mean, and interesting. By the way, I I, um, I interviewed Ross King, and he similarly sticks his head into a very very different bubble where mm. everything is shiny and squirrels because it's all different. And there's a lovely eclectic mix, and it sounds very similar to the type of you know a life in your a week in your life is always very different with lots of variety. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. There's a few basics that always happen, but yeah, it is it is very different. And obviously, if I get chance to you know pop up on a on on a TV show or something, that's great too. I did um, a little thing with Lorraine just before Christmas on um, on sort of uh, tips for for ditching the booze and 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 that was just fantastic because I think that's a completely new audience that may never have thought about this concept of kind of grey area drinkers you know you don't yes. have to be at rock bottom but you're not completely okay either so yes. yeah if I get to do things like that I see that's uh, that's the great thing and also I'm aware that your episode published this week on UK Health Radio is about the the slight sort of pitfalls of yo-yo dieting and how yeah it's not as effective food as addiction yeah yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that they they they, they, um, they very much interact. You know, lots of people kind of uh, um, you can use all the same principles that I talk yes. about with any behavior change you want to make, really. So optimum health and well-being. And we're going to get on to you specifically naming where else to find out about you in a little while. Mm -hmm. sure. So now within the clearing, which we're still in, I'm going to award you with a cake, Janie Lee Grace, for uh, graces with your presence. So um, we've talked about the dangers of your, your dieting, but do you like cake? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, if it's if it's a kind of fairly healthy cake, and I don't really say that in a pious way, I just genuinely don't really like very sweet stuff. So if it was like a kind of, um, you know, a, a cake made with beetroot, have you ever tried mm -hmm. one of them? They're really cool. Um, or, or something like an avocado mousse. I'd love that. Or maybe even, um, you know, a carrot cake. Go you. So we can have a myriad of multi layers of, of avocado. We can, we can, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, a healthy one, a, a kind of veggie cake. But I'll have so, a bit of icing on the top. That's cool. 
great segue because this is now your opportunity with your metaphorical cake. I'm only sad I can't actually give it to you now. But the metaphorical cherry that you now get to put on the icing of the cake is the final series of storytelling metaphors. So here we go. Mm -hmm. This is the metaphorical cake, multi-layered, unpacked. What's a favourite inspirational quote of yours that's always pulled you towards your future? Just while you're thinking about that, what notes or advice might you offer to a younger version of yourself? And then finally, inspired by Shakespeare and all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, Janie Lee Grace, I'd like to invite you to talk about legacy and how when all is said and done, you would most like to be remembered. Mm. So okay. it's again very existentially profound in its intention, uh, but we can un we can chomp on your cake gradually. How would you like to respond to that cake? Mm. Um, well, the first one. Sorry, I mean I'm not keeping this very poetic because I'm chipping in and asking questions. But the first one, um, I've forgotten what it was. Favorite inspirational quote. Inter no, oh, okay, no. Oh, I thought the first one was something else. It wasn't the first one. Was what it? Do you think it okay. What do you think it I is? Can't remember. I can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So my favourite inspirational quote, there's two actually. One is, I've no idea who said it, but it's literally this. You don't have to get it right. You do have to get it going. Okay. That has carried me through so much of what I do. And it's one of the things I say to the people I work with. If I'm, I'm, I train coaches, train people to, to work in this coaching field and they procrastinate sometimes for months and years. But you know yes. what? You don't have to get it right, but you do have to get it going. So you, I've no idea who said it first, but I like it. And by the way, as a coach myself, too, I resonate with that because of a lovely quote similar, which is the difference between what you want and what you get is what you do. Yes, so absolutely. It's the, it's the action towards that's so important. Yeah. So just yeah. say your quote. I know you're saying it for a third time, but I want to just let it float there with a bit of silence wrapped around it. So say your quote again. You don't have to get it right. You do have to get it going. Boom, shaka, wow, wow. And now what notes or advice with your great wisdom, which I'm definitely perceiving here, would you like to reflect back in giving notes to your younger self? Well, I think for my younger self, um, I would like to, I, I'd love to be able to tell my younger self um, that uh, I'm enough. <laughs> Everyone uses that phrase now, don't they? You are enough. Um, but um, I really didn't know that. I really didn't for many years. Uh, so, uh, so I'd like to tell my younger self that it's going to be OK and you will reach a point where you can actually even like yourself a bit. So, yeah. Because I wouldn't sound, have believed that. <laughs> and rather profoundly, because of your s sober club, it would sound like you found that version of yourself in the last three to four years since the sober club got going. In, in the last four years, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Before that, I mean, although I knew everything there was to know about meditation um, and, and taught staff and interviewed every guru going because I was a presenter on Hay House Radio, yeah. um, I it wasn't true for me. None of it was true for me. Um, I could kind of see the irony in that, but I didn't know how to deal with it. So, uh, yes, it's only in the last few years that I've actually come to realise that, you know, that the, the core of this is actually being able to be authentic with who you are. And by the way, that's a lovely segue to what's coming next next, which is where I'm going to talk to you about your moment in the sunshine, which is coming up. Um, whilst I've got you in this space, before we talk about legacy, what's the best piece of advice you would say you've ever been given? Uh, best piece of advice. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I was giving it personally, but from a book, it was, um, from, uh, the, uh, Susan Jeffers book, you know, Susan Jeffers is the author of feel the fear and do it anyway. But I think this was one from one of her other books where she says, never try and teach a pig to sing. It will waste your time and it annoys the pig. And, you know, obviously what that means is don't try and change someone else. Right. I spent so many years trying to change someone else. Um, you can't change someone else. You can only change yourself. So, um, yeah. So I love that. Don't try and teach a pig to sing, you know, or waste your time and it annoys the pig. And you don't want to go annoying the pig. I like <laughs> exactly. That. OK, so uh, thank you. You're really wonderful. Every time I sort of throw a googly at you, you're coming up with some wonderful reposts and, and answers. I'm not trying to catch you out. It's just lovely. You're giving me rich stuff. So I'm just going a bit deeper. So now then, um, legacy, a bit of cheeky Shakespeare now. How, when all is said and done on the journey, the path that you're on, Janie Lee Grace, would you like to be remembered? 
Uh, I'd, I'd like to be remembered as someone who um, was kind and someone who inspired other people to live their best life. Wonderful. And now uh, that is the end of your clearing, but we're now arriving to, as this is your moment in the sunshine within the clearing, um, I'll get there in just one second. I've forgotten. Where else can we find out about you on the internet? So give us, go as deep as you like onto your own URLs. Where can we find out more about you? Um, yeah, so lots of my stuff is uh, at thesoberclub.com. That's the kind of main platform for all the blogs and things I do. There's also imperfectlynatural.com, which is all the holistic living stuff. Um, I do media training and... Uh, that kind of thing as well that's all at genuinelygrace.com so basically if you google my name genuinely grace you'll find all of that stuff and on social media at genuinely grace and often heard doing awesome factoids on the steve wright show on BBC absolutely as well wonderful now as this is your moment in the sunshine genuinely grace and thank you for gracing us with your presence here in the good listening to clearing is there anything else you'd like to say no thank you that's it Ladies and gentlemen, but you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> no, I like that. And the rest is silence, to borrow the line from Hamlet. So you've been listening to Jamie Lee Grace. I've been Chris Grimes. This has been the Good Listening To Show. And uh, see you next time for more stories from the clearing. And it's on podcast two. Jamie Lee Grace, thank you so much. Thank and you. Good night. <laughs>